When you start talking about filmmakers, uh, take a few minutes to just reflect on the life of John Singleton. Many of you saw that, right? One of his films, my favorite was always Rosewood. So a lot of people talk about poetic justice in terms of uh, Boys in the Hood, James. But for me, Rosewood captured a moment in African American history, and it should be given the same kind of prominence, the same kind of uh, respect and adoration and criticism of respect coming from people who really praise the hell out of the boys in the hood and poetic justice, not to demean them at all. This is a special moment for me. The memento marvelicio. I mean, just to have this year wound for the moment. There's so much history here. It, it, I was going to say it's like more than 240 years of African and African American history. But I have to add at least 30 or 40 to it, huh? Mm -hmm. With just Dr. Small here, with Charles in the back. Charles Mitchell came in with Dr. Jeffries. Um, but having Woody King, the last name you saw up there, director, Woody King Jr. Come up with it. Yeah, that's good, Woody. And uh, you know, I had this here uh, fantastic introduction prepared. But Woody King, if you know anything about the theater in this country, the African American theater, its heritage, its prominence. Then there's one individual that I've known for virtually all of my politically conscious life, and that's Woody King. I know Woody because of this. I, go, I wrote this for you, Woody. Ah. <laughs> we go all the way back to Black Bottom. <laughs> Back to Detroit, where Paradise Malcolm, Valley, you know, the Nation of Islam, and what yeah. have you. But we also have an Alabama beyond Detroit. We're both Alabamians, you know. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about having you here with Dr. Lin Dr. Jeffries, come on up. Yeah, I like the black seat, so I'm glad that you did that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's take. You want this here one? Oh, that's, that's good. That's good. Yes, 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 that's good. You got to capture this one here. By the way, gang, Ken Sargent is documenting this for us. Uh, he was at the uh, he was at the Ruby D. Ossie Davis uh, street naming ceremony, you know, and he was uh, worked with me and Glenn Hunter at the uh, Harlem the gar uh, Gallery archives that we put together. And we do our best to try to document those uh, particularly momentous moments, you know, in our uh, Harlem history. And I think this is certainly an occasion for that. Um, 1937 was a remarkable year in African American history. In January of that year, hey. this man came screaming into the world. He Black stopped. Black he Black stopped. Black. In the summer of the same year, Woody King came into it. Right. I came right behind. <laughs> so that's why I begin to talk about, you know, all of the more than 240 years of African American history, and of course adding to that with having Dr. Small here. Uh, I didn't know he was going to come, James, so it's good to have you. Yeah, I just have to pick up my wife at 2 o'clock, you know. Uh-oh. <laughs> so oh. he's got a, the tyranny of the clock, okay, we'll watch you for that. Yeah. Well, you can maybe say, you can pick up with some of the stuff. We, James and I was at the... Um, the whole uh, rock, you know, we had this situation where back in 1969 when the students across this country, you know, began to grab hold to the academic realm. Black students, uh, Latin American students, Puerto Rican students right here began to command the classrooms. I was at Wayne State University in those days and 
Dr. J was what? You were, were you at San Jose at that time, uh, out in the West Coast? When, hmm? what date now? 1969. You was here. No. Uh, mm -hmm. See, I'm bicoastal. Uh, 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 not bi bisexual, <laughs> bicoastal. <laughs> <laughs> so 1969, January, you have me here at, Shitty Co at City College. <laughs> In June, I go to San Jose for a conference. They're looking at five or six of us to see who can set up their African Black Studies program. And I get the, uh, they give me the, privilege of setting up a black studies program. So June 1969, I called back to my wife and I said, I bought you a house. She said, you're crazy. <laughs> I said, no, uh, I'm taking a job in San Jose. The students want me to, they don't want me up in the hills. They don't want me down in Monterey. They don't want me in Silicon Valley. They want me right near the university. So there's four houses they asked me to pick, all of them the same. $22,000, nice little home. Whoa. So I pick one in Silicon Valley for 2000 down and $22,000 mortgage. So 1969, I was, I played both coasts. And, uh, and then I went to Africa during the summer. Mm -hmm. Then in September, no. I went to Africa part of the summer, but I was in Guyana. Uh, uh, as part of that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you look at Dr. J, you have to see him flying here and flying there. Globally. He, even the Puerto Rico is the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a part of our world too. Let me add to that because I would not be here without his endorsement, without his imprimatur, because the classes that I teach, he taught. The room and I share with my colleagues here, he initiated, inaugurated, set in motion what we understand about black studies here at City College. He stands synonymous, you know, with struggle. In one of the books, I brought just one book that he's connected, a beautiful essay that he did here with a uh, Kwaku person, Lynn, called First Word, Black Scholars and Thinkers and Warriors. And I think all of those words apply to Dr. Jeffries. And there's a lengthy <coughs> bio here. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to give that take up that time because he can kind of fill in the blanks in terms of his uh, connection with Malcolm X. These are the students who are studying the life and legacy of Malcolm X. I can read it in their faces. They're getting scared <laughs> about touching that. You can see that. But huh? I know their hearts are ready. Right. Persons who who were close to Malcolm uh, are gone. But one who was close to him and the family is here. And that's Professor Smalls. And he was here in the student takeover in 1969. And uh, his, uh, he's bicoastal also. He's had the West Coast experience plus the uh, New York experience plus the South Carolina experience, Georgetown, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I got Virginia and Georgia too, so they're just been oh, raising I, up Alabama. Okay, go to okay. Southern boy. <laughs> we have to see the Here, family connection. In, in one of the books, Woody again is very prolific in terms of not only film, but in terms of literature and putting out plays. And this one here is new plays for the uh, black theater that he edited. And it's a nice biography of him, in, but I won't uh, pick up the time with that. Because uh, Uzi John Singleton, uh, Martin Kilson, we can get, maybe talk to Martin Kilson about him a little later. Martin Kilson has left us? Yes, he's oh, joined the ancestors. That's unfortunate. But um, um, of course, the students would probably know little or nothing about him, but mm -hmm. we'll fill that in. Let me do some housekeeping here real quick. Real quick. Um, we have only one more session, gang. One more session, and that'll be a short one, an abbreviated one, because on May the 11th, I have to skedaddle out to the House of the Lord Church in Brooklyn. We have an event out there. I hit you with the email. Some of you saw it. Some of you already responded to it. Thanks, thanks Nelson, for your donation. Uh, some of you can't make it. Perhaps you can fill in your space there spiritually, financially, and help us in terms of this uh, financial drive we have a very debilitating disease on one of our outstanding communications organizers, Don Rojas, who is now uh, struggling, battling against uh, bone marrow cancer. 
And it's very debilitating, not only physical, the treatments you have to go through, the transfusions, chemo, and what have you, but also you know, the financial burden that it has on the family. So, so far on GoFundMe, and you can go to GoFundMe, uh, Don Rojas, or Karen Rojas, and see that so far, oh, more than 225 people have donated more than $26,000. But we have a goal of 100,000. You'll need a lot more there because it's a very costly treatment in terms of bone marrow cancer. So, so we have a short session, but I got a surprise guest for you, so you don't want to miss him uh, next week. Uh, but that'll be closing it down. One of the important date on your calendar is when your term papers are due, and that's on the 17th. You know, that, I have to cut it off at that point because. I'll be getting out of Dodge myself. So, so you get, try to get them in, meet, meet that deadline. If you can't, be in touch with me. Let me know if you have extenuating circumstances and it can't be done. Um, so anyway, let's, let's, I want to get back to the film and maybe Woody can just fill us in, Woody, a little bit about the making of that film. There's some water here that you can share with Dr. J and James, you know, if you want to. Give us some background in terms of uh, corralling Morton, Morgan Freeman in particular. <laughs> um, here's the irony of it all. I was, uh, uh, you mentioned 69, okay. I was working with, uh, on the Lower East Side uh, of Manhattan with a group called Mobilization for Youth mm. uh, with uh, um, blacks, Hispanic, Asians, our youth. And um, Adam Clayton Powell helped us get one of the largest grants ever to pay these youth to come to these poverty programs. And um, a lot of money went to How You Act, a lot of money went to Mobilization for You, and a lot of money went to uh, Bedford Stuyvesant Redevelopment Cooperation. However, I had a training program in the arts, and uh, having come out of Detroit, having come out of um, uh, a kind of social, artistic background, and an unbelievable struggle uh, to do theater in Detroit at the same time Motown was ascending, and uh, uh, I came to New York and uh, came to New York. I just graduated from uh, Willoway School of Theater. And uh, the congressman was impressed that here's a guy who is in New York who graduated from theater. <coughs> don't you know there ain't no black people in theater? <laughs> you know, so uh, I tried to make those young people, the most powerful young artists in the city of New York. And everybody from Harry Belafonte and Third World Cinema came there and picked them up and offered them jobs. And uh, I took a lot of them to Rome, to Hemisphere 68, uh, 69. And you could barter flights, you could barter uh, airlines and didn't have to pay. Bar the hotels if you were doing it for a good cause. And um, I think uh, Hubert Humphrey was then the um, vice president of the United States. And so he invited these kids. That's what we were. I was like, I think 27, and most of the kids were 18. They captured the imagination of the arts community. And we got into filmmaking as one of the side uh, organizations. And I wanted to make socially relevant films. And uh, Cliff Frazier, a lot of you may know him, uh, worked for Community Film Workshop Council and started that and became very close with Ozzy and Ruby and they became very uh, instrumental in it. Okay, Sidney Poitier became very instrumental in it. 
what kind of films do you guys want to ma want to make? Anti-drug films. We made a lot of anti short anti-drug films. Okay. Somehow, I got the idea. I wanted to do the research and do a book on Malcolm's assassination. Mm -hmm. And uh, and doing that book from I mean I collected. I got so much material, and I still have it. I, 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 I tried to give it to the library, um, Schomburg. Then I'm going to give it to the Azalea Hackley Collection, a black collector uh, at the Detroit Public Library. Okay. And uh, out of this material came the idea that Morgan and I would do a play on Malcolm. However, talking to Denzel Washington, it became a three-way thing where Denzel wanted to do the play. He had never done a, uh, a play of this magnitude. Uh, it was he and Elijah parting, parting ways. And Denzel was so specific in developing that Malcolm that he had to play it. And I produced it. Um, everybody came to see him. It was scary to see him walk into the theater because he would start as Malcolm from uh, getting out of the uh, car to come into the theater, to walk out to walk into the space, people would actually would actually gasp uh, to watch him develop the character of the glasses, the hat, how he would walk, uh, and it was called when chickens came home to roost. Spike Lee saw the him do that play as a kid in college. Twenty years later, Denzel does the film. Okay. And so Morgan and I kept on working because the film that you saw, you know, are filled with subtleties that you cannot do on stage. The look, the people from Africa, the people from uh, 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 different countries wanting Malcolm to come there, uh, uh, the, the, the music of Max Roach. You can't do that on stage. The narration uh, by Ozzy Davis. You can't do that. It's things you cannot do on stage. Uh, and uh, already, Morgan Freeman was so interested in the film aspect. There are things in film that he did then that had not been developed. The asides, the pulling, the, the co-star along to talk secretly to him in the camera. Uh, uh, to talking to his wife. Yeah, that was uh, Martin Luther King's daughter, Yolanda King, who played his wife. Okay. Um, and uh, that group of people, the waitress in the coffee shop, is, his, uh, is Alicia Keys' mother. Okay. The you kind of people. this stuff before we saw the film. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. There are people in the, in the film, uh, the South African guy, um, Salado Moretti, uh, worked in Nelson Mandela's organization when, once he went back there until uh, Mr. Mandela died. It was the, these kind of connections we you had back then as a theater artist, as an educator. Like all you had to do was call Salado Moretti. Oh yeah, I mean I'll be there. All Herb has to do is call. You know, the, the world is beginning to change. Like if you wanted to go to University of Mississippi, a University of Michigan. All we had to do was pick up the phone, and you would be there. 
your grades was good, you know what I mean? It was not like uh, uh, a whole kind of uh, uh, unbelievable difficulty reaching people. If you went to Ghana, you went, you know, so I got a hotel in Ghana. And that's why you were going to stay. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know? We, we have a hotel in Ghana. Yeah, that, 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 yeah that's what I'm talking about. You know, he said, oh, this is Dr. Small's hotel. Okay. Okay. Okay, and we'll go to Cape Coast Castle, but we're going to go to and stay in the hotel. That's where we stay. You know, it's not like a, once you find um, globally our connection, you hang in there. You support with whatever, you know. So, we got ready to make this film. And you will notice that Herb said uh, the credits are so important. You look at the credits and say, whoa, man. How did you get these people? Diallo McLean. Kim Sizemore. Kim Sizemore. Wow. Yeah, a major American uh, black woman who works in films. Who we took to Africa years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She just celebrated some big anniversary in our life. Okay, so, and Morgan wanted desperately to, to have a product that he would take into Hollywood to show the kind of films he made, he wanted to make. However, he only made one film, Bopar, set in Africa, you know, uh, uh, because after a while, you are, uh, I don't want to say bought off, you are given Academy Awards, and you're given so much money to do this film, and you're going to get to your next film soon. But before you can get to your next film, a great deal of money is offered to you for the film you're going to do next. Whether it's Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood, or whether it's, you know, Million Dollar Baby, you know, it's you're given so much money, and you just won the Academy Award. Okay. Now, when he was doing Glory. It was eight actors out of that I worked with in the lead roles in that film. Only three made it. Andre Barrow, the television, Denzel, and Morgan. The other two brilliant, brilliant actors. One, just out of nowhere, was murdered. Walking down the street, murdered. Okay, uh, And the other just disappeared. So in this business, you don't know what's going to be next. Okay. Now, the script of it, I did on uh, in Montauk. I went out there, I stayed a month, and I wrote the script in a month. I came back, shared it with Ozzie Davis. That's the first person I shared it with. And uh, he gave me Maybe a page of notes. I included that page of notes and started looking for the money. You saw Toby Macbeth down there. The Macbeth, Macbeth brothers started the new Lafayette Theater in Harlem. It's, it's, we're all connected. You know, uh, like Herb said, we're Detroiters. <laughs> okay. That was finding the money to uh, to do it. So that is how, and most of those people in the film came from the theater. By the way, they worked in the theater. I worked in the theater. I produced plays, and uh, and I've been producing plays off Broadway, on Broadway since wow, seventy two, seventy three for colored girls who consider suicide when the rain boys are not I produced that. Put the wine cellars by by another Detroiter, uh, Ron Milner, Ed Bullins, the Taking of Miss Janey, which won the Drama Critics Circle Award uh, as best play of the year. 
and uh, plays that just toured around uh, the world in Australia, London. And so I had access to people. And Morgan, until maybe three years ago, I could get on the phone, I could call him up, we'd talk for hours. He'd come in, you know, he just, he, while, while I was sitting here, uh, Glenn Turman called to say, uh, where are you at? And I said, uh, I'm at uh, uh, the class, you know, uh, Dr. Boyd, where is it at? I said, where are you at? I'm in New York. I come up there. I said, uh, will you be there at 3 o'clock? No. <laughs> okay. So, the, to tell you, back in 81, 82, when I made this film, the musicians, uh, you, you go to uh, the Vanguard or any jazz club, where Miles, I mean, where uh, uh, Max Roach was playing. And then you talk before, you talk afterwards. That when you're dealing with a musician, he'll give you the music when it's ready. It's never there when you want it. You know, that's the thing about artists, you know, except actors. Actors are ready, they want a paycheck on Thursday. A musician, uh, when it's ready. <laughs> I'm, doing a, I'm doing a piece on Miles. I can't find no Miles Davis. But the writer, he wants it to go now. If you don't have no Miles, you don't have no play. You know what I'm saying? If you don't have no actor who can do those subtleties, you don't have no Max. I mean, uh, uh, you don't have no uh, Malcolm. So, the chemistry between um, Yolanda King uh, and Morgan was like amazing. It was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Adela Shabazz had uh, uh, Malcolm's daughter, that's his oldest daughter. Uh, she and Yolanda had a theater company and another sister, I forgot who the sis, other sister was, anybody? It was three of them. Yeah, three, it was three of them. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. okay. And uh, so I asked Yolanda, Adela called me late one evening, really late at night, he said, I don't want to put a damper on it. <laughs> but she was. She was putting a damper on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the only problem we had in making the picture because Adela wanted to do that role, mm -hmm. the mother. Oh, wow. And uh, so it, it changed from Sunday, February 21st. That was the title of it. <laughs> to Death of a Prophet. You know, uh, to, to death of a prophet. Um, there was no other problems. Um, stock footage, footage of the famine in uh, uh, Biafra. Uh, the uh, suffering on all these countries, which Malcolm was so hip to, so aware of that he could not join them <laughs> in that making other people suffer like that. You know, they're talking away, talking away, and all Malcolm was, just, you know, that's, that was what I found in my research. Malcolm said, oh, they want me to come and join them and hurting the people of the earth, the suffering, you know, I cannot do that. Even if they give me heads of universities, if they give me all kinds of money. Uh, so that's how, how it started. That's how it started. Yeah. Uh, 
James, you have the clock on you a bit. Yeah. Kind of pick it up with um, following the assassination of Malcolm. I think you really you entered a picture in a very significant way in terms of the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Maybe you can pick it up and fill us in on that. Well, I met Malcolm originally when I was 16, 1963. And I actually came from South Carolina to meet him because I saw him on television. It's so extraordinary. So I told my mom, I need to meet this guy. So she brought me out of here and I met him. And he was passing out flyers against the Marsh in Washington in front of the Food Family Supermarket on 141st and 8th Avenue. Only thing I remember of the conversation, him telling me, go to college, that education will help the free young people. He was very big on education. Um, I would go back to the South. I was in the military. While I was away, he was assassinated. I came home a few months later, um, became the bodyguard of his sister, Ella. And in January 67, I was elected as the imam of the Muslim mosque. Went to Mecca in 74, 75. Back in those days, I was El Haji and um, Shaggy. But being the, the bodyguard of his sister Ella, you know, who was kind of like big sister mother, um, we don't hear a lot about her and some of the dialogue. I ended up with access. It was really weird at first, her, because Ella, who saw Malcolm as her son, so I got to sleep in Malcolm's bedroom. I wore Malcolm's pajamas, I wore Malcolm's bathrobe, I read Malcolm's notes because everything was there. The books he read was all there, the notes he made was there. And during those years serving both as bodyguard for her, secretary to her, and to be the imam over that mosque for 11 years, we had, you have to appreciate at this moment in history we had war. We had war with the nation of Islam. We had war with elements of the government that we discovered whose involvement was in Malcolm's death. And it was a very traumatic, kind of difficult time. Um, but we all survived it. But what I learned about Malcolm uh, during that period, and, and Woody, who I know almost as long <laughs> as, I know, as I know um, Sister Ella, um, he was just absolutely, totally committed to freedom of black people. I mean, he didn't have any waivers on either side. He wasn't unsure in any way. He was clear that people had to be free. And he was clear, as he said, the price of freedom is death. And he was willing to meet that, and he did meet that. Um, I got very close to Sister Betty. She was like a big sister mother. She paid for my graduate school. Um, we did a lot together, even going to Grenada to Malcolm's uh, mama's home and doing lectures down there and bringing the family together in St. George's. Um, trying to maintain the legacy. When Malcolm first died, people were too afraid. You couldn't hand him a flyer. I mean, black people had him a fly with Malcolm's picture on it, they wouldn't take it. <laughs> wow. People were frightened. So we came up with an idea one night, we said we're gonna get up in the morning at five o'clock and we're gonna spend the whole night, we're gonna fold these flyers up and then somebody's gonna take St. Nicholas Avenue, a group take 8th Avenue, 7th Avenue, Atlantic, and we're gonna put it under everybody's windshield, the wiper. So at least they get to look at Malcolm's face <laughs> in the morning <laughs> before they get in their car. But Ella started a, a pilgrimage on um, May 19, 1965, uh, to the gravesite of Malcolm, which we've maintained for the last 54 years, and we'll be going now on May 19th this year. This is the 54th year. Dr. Jeffries has been with me on it for about almost 40 years. I got no well, fooling with you on all yeah. these things. <laughs> but um, Malcolm's birthday is May 19th. May 19th. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the Malcolm around the world symbolizes strength. I've been all over the world, the Caribbean, Africa, all over this country. Malcolm symbolized a strength that I don't see in any other leader in the minds of people. When you say Malcolm X, it's almost a kind of a purity that people see him without any flaws. And 
it was me and Dr. Jeffries um, who sat with the Minister Farrakhan and sort of signed the peace treaty between us and they. We came with a certain amount of brothers from the Sons of Africa, and he came with a certain amount of FOI. We met at the National Black Theater. It was set up by Khalid Muhammad and said, the war is over. Um, the past is the past. We have to work for the freedom of our people. And so we, 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 we moved from there. But I think one of the key things to understand when we think of Malcolm is the role of the government of the United States in his assassination. It was very key. But sometimes we miss the role of the Saudi government, the role of the British government, and the role of the French government. Because we sometimes don't cross into that space. But the Saudi government gave thumbs up because they were afraid of Malcolm. Malcolm, when he went to Egypt and the Middle East, he was going to speak to the Muslim youth. And he was invited by the Muslim Student Association. Well, the Muslim youth was trying to move against the despotic leadership of the Arab world. And they didn't appreciate that at all. And so we, under those of us who was in the inside, you know, we understood that very well. That day in the ballroom that Woody captured, if you could see that moment in the first five moments after he hit that stage, you can see a man in a three-piece blue suit leaning at his head with a recessive, recessive hairline. He was calling himself Richard Jones in those days, and he was from the CIA. Okay you will see another man walk up to Malcolm, take something out of his pocket, wear a light brown trench jacket, and walk away. That was the list of the names that Malcolm was going to call out as his killers and others. In those few minutes, so much, the, the room was full of government people. And the one thing no one is really sure of today is who killed Malcolm. The shotgun knocked him down. But Malcolm was up on a stage, you gotta remember that. I knew the Audubon before they tore the stage down. The bullet, the firing of the pistols, most of them hit him in his foot and traveled up his leg. One made it to his stomach, I think. The pellets that hit him in his chest, he probably would have survived that. But somebody shot Malcolm through the back. That don't get discussed, people don't talk about it. Sometimes they try to put it on his bodyguard, but Reuben, didn't have, Reuben didn't do that. Reuben was the only one that hit one of the assassins. Um, at least seven assassins was in that room. You had the two guys arguing. They're back a little bit. You had the two people that threw the smoke bombs. You had the three people doing the shooting up front. Now those are what we could know immediately from what happened in the ballroom that day. But when they made, um, Say it. What is it called? Uh, somebody made a documentary. It's called. Say it. it was the first time we saw eight millimeter footage of Malcolm's assassination, and no one is explaining where that footage came from. But somebody filmed that assassination, and the people on the stage. I feel sorry as for most for the police officer, Gene Robinson. I don't think Gene would have done anything to hurt Malcolm. He was an undercover teenager, really, just out of the academy, assigned basically to give information back. But a lot of times, I had undercover people on me for many years. I actually have a daughter by an undercover agent. We got undercover. You know? <laughs> 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 You, what you'll find is that many of those people get attached to the people they are sent to spy on. Yes. And, and so a lot of focus was on Gene Roberts, but I think that was a misfocus. The focus should have been on some of those other players on that stage. <laughs> the electronic nigger. Yes. <laughs> but the, the, the extraordinary thing about this man, he was a Muslim, but he had arrived at a point where he told us to put our religion in the closet. Because he said, if unity is going to become between us, we have to come together as African peoples. A lot of people don't want to project that. They want to project them just as the Muslim, um, or just as the black nationalist freedom fighter. But he was both. But Islam is your personal religion. That's between you and your, your, your creator. It has nothing to do with other people. You know. 
And so what he was trying to do is really take the United States before the UN. At that time, we really thought the UN was a legitimate body that would really help bring justice to African peoples. And I think there was two things I think caused them to speed up the hit, because I don't think they were going to kill them as quickly as they did. But going before the UN was one. And the fact that there was a meeting two weeks before his death in Brooklyn at Ruby Dee's brother's house. Um, I forgot the brother's name. And in that meeting, all of the civil rights leaders from around the country came, except Dr. King. But Dr. King sent an emissary. And in that meeting, they agreed to work together. You know? And two weeks later, oh, Fannie Lou Hamer was at that meeting. Yes. And Fannie Lou invited him to come to Mississippi two weeks hence. He would have been in Mississippi like a week after the day he was killed. Now, and they imagine... the militant forum together, too. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when you imagine a Malcolm X with the message he was carrying, teaming up with a Fannie Lou Hamer, Dr. Martin Luther King, and the Southern Movement, because we say civil rights movement and we think of the Southern states, but there was a black movement across America, which never gets referenced with a label. You know, Detroit, and Ohio, and New York, and California. Black people are moving and they're protesting and they're raising issues but the media never labeled that anything. So they took the five or six states in the South and center our movement historically around that. But there was a national movement among black people with multiple organizations and multiple ideological thrusts, socialism, communism, black nationalism, all going on at the same time. Malcolm would have been the bridge that would bring those two movements, that Southern movement and the Northern, Midwest, and Western movement together. America could not have that. I think we put a little bit too much emphasis on the internationalization of Malcolm and don't look at what the implications of the domestic arrangements would have been in terms of white America. And then when we come, and then I'll set up after this, because I know I've got to pick my baby up, because she ain't mine with y'all. Um, <laughs> the... That's what the February the 4th speech that he gave at Brown Memorial <laughs> Church down in, in Selma. Yes. February the 4th. So it's actually like leading up to the 14th, 10 but, days later. Right. His house is They did not want bombs. that union to happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the coming before the UN, at that time, you got to remember in history, 1965, 64, going into 65, Russia and America is fighting for the minds of the third world. Okay. This is the height of the Cold War. Russia wants to be the influence in Asia and Africa, Amer and Latin America. It, America wants to be the influence in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And here's this one little black guy from America who has thrown a monkey wrench and all of that <laughs> by pulling the cover off of America's treatment of black Americans. And now he's talking about going before the United Nations and presenting a petition charging America with genocide. <laughs> with the support of the Guyana government at that time, with the support of Kenya government and other African governments, in particular Kenya, Tanzania, and Guyana. And after Malcolm's death, multiple others were assassinated. You know, his partner in Kenya was assassinated. Mr. Cummings from Guyana, who was the ambassador, was, they said he jumped from a 22-story window downtown or someplace, but we knew better than that. <laughs> and multiple <laughs> others died, almost 14 persons within three weeks of his assassination. And we rarely do the research on why those men who he was associated with all went within a month. But that's the government of the United States of America. Because two, Malcolm threatened their thrusts as the new colonizers of Africa. You know, Britain and France was being pushed out. But America was trying to come in. and. Malcolm threatened that by exposing the nature of America when it comes to how they treat people of color in America, particularly the African American. James, that's so. a very interesting segue. You kind of throw it right into the lab of Dr. Jeffries in terms of Malcolm and the African connection. Yeah, good question. Just, just a second, Keith. Well, as soon as he finishes, you can finish. These things work out well. At one point, Professor Boyd was, whoa, 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 what's going to happen? They're not here. And then all of a sudden, we all fall in place. And so it's a, it's a fantastic connection. 
um, the creative literary uh, part of of our important life in our revolution, represented by my brother here, and the young struggler, uh, revolutionary spirit is represented by Professor Smalls. And then I had this unusual opportunity uh, of being involved internationally in the struggle. I went to Europe in 1959-60, and that's when I met many of the great leaders, 1959-60. So by the time the death of Malcolm comes, I had been moving around the world from 61, 2, 3, 4. I was all in Africa, all these African nations. Uh, Professor Boyd has given us this, uh, with Eliasha, this diary, this journal of his activity. And when you see the, uh, the pilgrimage, which was an enormous experience for him, but then he comes into contact with the African leaders on the Nile Valley in one of the great um, uh, ships there. They had many of the African leaders because the organization of African unity was formed in 63. And then in 64, they had a meeting in Cairo. And it so happened that Malcolm was there. And the, the, the description of him meeting these leaders and whatnot, uh, for me, just was riveting because at the same time that that Malcolm had a chance to meet the leaders on this uh, ship. I, I had a chance to meet them in their base. I had a chance to meet Sekou Turi in Guinea because we were planning a programs in Guinea, and Kuma, Modi Bukaita. Uh, so the U.S. government did not want unity of the black struggle in the United States, and they definitely did not want to have this black consciousness relate to the African Revolution on the continent. And Malcolm was a bridge to all of that. It's the most fantastic thing that to have this revolutionary spirit moving, linking up with King, not pushing away from King, willing to be right there to take a bullet for King. And that was the biggest fear. But then meeting with Sekou Toure, Ahmed Bambela, uh, Nkrumah, uh, uh, head of Kenya, um, Kenyatta. Kenyatta. I mean, that was an extraordinary uh, bridge over troubled waters because I've seen my life as a, a, a search for a pan-African mission that's been a bridge over troubled waters and for me to even see my son, I'm reading the names of people that Malcolm was meeting Essien Udom was one of the brothers who struggled for this history, he did one of the first books on the, on the, on the nation and he comes out of Nigeria his wife was either African-American or African-Caribbean, so he was one of those persons that Dr. Clark connected us to. And then to, to see that he's also meeting, when he was in Ghana, a brother who always carried a manuscript with him. His name was Asa Davis, and he had a, a manuscript on Ethiopia. Uh, he was hooked up with Brazil. The, these were the people that Malcolm was making a special connection with. So in his death, the transformation into African world consciousness is clear. In his death, clarity on the struggle in America becomes clear. In his death, the systems that rule expose themselves. J. Edgar Hoover said, we cannot have another, we can't have a prophet. He, he helped to remove Messiah, he helped to remove Marcus Garvey, and here comes another Messiah <laughs> to experience. And so the, the fact that he could move through the world with this spiritual power, this revolutionary consciousness, and then leave us this enormous legacy that now we have in classrooms like this. Uh, that's the great thing that you are actually experienced through our brother here. You have to leave James? Okay. You see how... Give a us a parting shot. One, one thing before you leave. Uh, you were talking about, at the Audubon, the late uh, Baba Herman Ferguson, mm -hmm. in his book, talks about the yellow light that was flashed in terms of somebody documenting that whole situation. Mm -hmm. To what extent is that has no credibility at all for you? No, it, it does. Like that eight millimeter footage that showed up when they were doing uh, Make It Plain. That remember the documentary? Make It Plain, okay. They actually interviewed me for four hours, but they didn't put anything yeah. in there. Yeah. Um, but it was Make It Plain the first time we saw uh, motion picture footage. 
of the assassination. Mm -hmm. But we know how this government works. They they photograph everything, mm -hmm. you know. They, so, and we, you know, over the years uncovered some of the undercovers. So we knew that at least three people on the stage were government persons, mm -hmm. you know, different agency. The young man we know, Gene, he was NYPD, but we because he was so obvious, he was made the culprit, but he was not the real culprit. Mm -hmm. There were other figures on that stage that, who come to make sure he was dead. Um, and that's what their jobs were. Hang on just, James, I want you to witness this. Uh, Vanessa, before you come up. Yes. I brought all these men, I've got some women up here. And in the African tradition, out of death comes new life, resurrection and rebirth. So Malcolm represents the death that you witnessed, represent the beginning of a rebirth. His spirit and consciousness was so powerful that 10 years after, in South Africa, a young revolutionary, Steve Biko, inspired the youth to rise up, take bullets, and give their life. And Malcolm X, well, inspired Steve Biko, and Steve Biko left us with these important words. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. He was able to put, show how awakening our youth is the most frightening thing that an oppressive uh, force has. And it was the children that stood up and took the bullets. And then when the children stood up, the women said, we can't have our babies. Uh, Nelson Mandela and the rest of them were out of the country in exile. It was the awakening of the children and the, and the women. women. That made that stuff. Dr. J, uh, Vanessa. Well, I saw you scheming, you. plotting, and planning. <laughs> I was going to ask you to do it, so I'm glad that you had the chance to, to do it without. Hey, Hello. how you doing? I'm good. Well, you look as good as, <laughs> as ice cream and chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> so on behalf of Professor Boyd, I want yes. to give you this value. Hey, uh, this. The best thing that happened today outside of Woody is to, to have this uh, work. I'm actually, I had to take notes on every trip I made to Africa and the Caribbean. I've made over 100. And I'm actually comparing my notes to my movement as this movement. That's why I said your connection is so important. And so don't die. Stay around here for <laughs> <laughs> She wants you to turn to page 37. Uh-oh. Oh. Yeah, they close it up. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm here for you, Woody King. This is uh, another one of my fine students, Latoya. Wow. The diary of Malcolm X. Yes. There it is. And it's, it's real. You can feel him. You can feel his. Woody, turn to page 37. Oh, man. Close it up. <laughs> James, you got yours coming. I'm, I'm, I wasn't I'm where you were may, may I say one other thing? Sure, go ahead, James. Because I'm actually working as a consultant Thanks on an ABC, so. mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's an ABC Disney piece with, um, well, not Netflix, it was the, the other big, MGM. And we've done 10 episodes already, it'll come out in the fall. It's called Godfather of Harlem. But the subtitle is when the Harlem Underground meets the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. So what I was able to do, they hired me just to do the history of Harlem. Mm -hmm. I called your son because I was trying to reach out to you back to you. <laughs> but what I convinced them to do is to tell them you can't do the history of the last 10 years of Bumpy Johnson, 57 to 60, 63 to 68, mm -hmm. or 57 to 68, without understanding that in Harlem you got two other major figures. Adam Clayton Powell and Malcolm X. So Malcolm X is going to appear in 12 episodes. Whoa. Um, and it's well done. That's what it is. playing Bumpy Johnston. There's a young African American brother out of Atlanta, Nigel Thatch. He looks like Malcolm. Mm. And he's learned Malcolm. Matter of fact, What's one day name? I invited Malcolm's nephew there. What's the name and, of the brother you were talking oh, about? Oh, Nigel Thatch. No. But the nephew had to cry. He just gave away. Yeah, I know. Surprise. I'm not supposed to get for next week. That's what's coming. Brothers Is that your first coming next week? Brothers Zaire comes next week. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and so the it's last funny. piece of this is 
we've got Clifton Davis playing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I got the messenger in there too. Right? And Clifton looks just like the messenger. He's taller. But when he puts on the kufi and the camera, you don't realize he's that tall. And it's going to be an extraordinary drama, fiction, historical piece. It'll start airing in the fall. So look forward to Clifton's it. back in New York. Clifton, yeah, he's working on some projects up in Connecticut. And I hadn't seen Clifton since 1970 when he got me thrown in jail in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good meeting. Wow. Yeah, I, I ran into the set. Uh, uh, second yeah, we, we did a number of them up here. Now. Uh, I joke, uh, I did. Thank you, Jay.